my God, how great thou art. Who is Jesus? You know, that's the most important question each one of us has to answer. What do you think about Jesus? Who do you say he is? Of course, what we believe about Jesus must be grounded in a true and correct knowledge of who he is, as given to us in Scripture. We have to think correctly about him, not make a Jesus in our own image. But the most important question ever asked, who do you say that Jesus is? The way you answer that determines your eternal destiny. The Jews viewed the Messiah as nothing more than a human man. They expected him to be an earthly ruler of great power, to be a person of influence. He'd conquer their enemies. He'd fulfill the promises given to Abraham, repeated to his children, expanded in the promises given to David of a coming king and a kingdom. But the Messiah in the Jewish way of thought would be a son of David, a descendant of David. And like David, he would defeat Israel's enemies. He would usher in a, a glorious kingdom. They viewed the coming Messiah as the savior of the nation, not a savior of their souls. They did not, in Jesus' day, they still do not, in our day, believe the Messiah would be God in human flesh. Now, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. We've been looking at a series of encounters Jesus faces in the temple in the, in the days before his crucifixion. And, and, and in each one of these confrontations, he's asked a question, and he's impressed his uh, opponents with his authority, with his wisdom, and with his answers. Uh, so much so that it came to a point that no one dared ask him any more questions. But following the positive encounter with the scribe that we looked at last week in verses 28 through 34, we now come to the first of two episodes that present the scribes in a much less favorable light. You know, as we've said, and as we know, the scribes were the experts in the law. They were experts in the Old Testament. They were revered. They were looked up to. Uh, as a matter of fact, they, they dressed differently than everyone else in the Jewish culture of that day. You could recognize the scribe because he wore a long white linen robe hemmed by a long white fringe. And, and these impressive white clothes made them stand out wherever they went, especially among the common people who wore more bright colors. Uh, when a scribe passed by, people would stand to honor them. They greeted him respectfully as rabbi, master, uh, master or father. Uh, when the wealthy gave feasts, they, the scribes were considered a necessary ornament to gild their meal. It brought honor to the place. And when they came to a meal, they were given the place of honor, reclining to the right or to the left of the host. Scribes were even honored higher above the aged, the elderly, even above their own parents. Uh, when the scribes came to the synagogue, they sat in the place of honor. They faced the congregation with their backs against the chest containing the Torah. Everyone could see them. The scribes were the scriptural authority in Israel. And, and Jesus, throughout his, his time here on, uh, on earth and his ministry here, he, he often admits they have the right answers, but they're incomplete. So for, for example, they taught that Elijah must come before the Messiah, and Jesus agreed with that. But the scribes didn't recognize Elijah when he came. They didn't recognize John the Baptist for who he was. Uh, just recently, we saw a scribe knows the two greatest commandments, and he knows these are superior to all the burnt offerings and all the sacrifices. But he remains outside the kingdom of God. Now we learn that Jewish leaders teach that the Messiah is going to be the son of David. And you think about it, this goes back to Bartimaeus. When he was healed, he hailed Jesus as the son of David. There was cries of adulation on Palm Sunday when Jesus entered the city along the same lines. And it points forward to the question raised at Jesus' trial by the high priest when he asked Jesus, are you the Christ, 
the son of the blessed one. And, and, and so our text today, uh, Mark 12, verses 35 through 37, challenges the scribes' ideas about the Messiah. The next episode, in verses 38 and following, it's a rebuke of their character and motives. But, but Mark seems to be balancing the previous episode where, where the scribe was not far from the kingdom, where he, he was thinking he was receptive, but still outside the kingdom. He's balancing that with the majority of the scribes who are resistant to God's purpose and kingdom. And, and so having silenced the religious leaders trying to trap him, he now takes the offensive. He asks a question of his own. He turns the tables on them with a question about the Messiah as the son of David. And the question shows us the Messiah is much more than the traditional Jewish expectations of him. And Jesus and his questions confounds his opponents, silences his opponents. There's no response recorded that they give him. They have no answer for his wisdom. They have to look for other ways to get rid of him, which they will eventually do. Read with me, if you will, just verses 35, 36, and 37 of Mark chapter 12. God's word tells us, And Jesus began to say, as he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself said in the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So in what sense is he his son? And the large crowd enjoyed listening to him. Once again, Jesus is in the temple area. He's teaching uh, something that he does daily in the temple. We find out in chapter 14. In the pre, uh, three previous episodes, Jesus has been addressed as teacher. And, and even though Mark doesn't record as much teaching of Jesus than Matthew or Luke, he often identifies Jesus as a teacher, refers to his authoritative teaching. But by asking the people, them, a question most likely prompted by the, the, the statement to the scribe in verse 34, you're not far from the kingdom of God. It's now an invitation for that scribe and the rest of the religious leaders to embrace Jesus as Messiah, as the Son of God, as their Savior. And I think his, his question here is an evangelistic appeal to those who might have been open to the gospel, such as the past scribe might have been. His question certainly isn't like the ones that was asked of him by the men from the Sanhedrin. Theirs came from evil motives intended to trap him, to destroy him. But, but Jesus' question is offering salvation to them. And so according to Matthew's account, Jesus began by asking the religious leaders this question. What do you think about the Christ, the Messiah, whose son is he? Well, the Messiah is the son of David. They knew that. That was clear. In their minds, it meant just another, another human like David. What David was, that's what the son of David will be. Maybe better, maybe more powerful, maybe wiser, but still just a human king, certainly not a savior. They didn't think they needed a savior. And they certainly didn't think of a Jewish Messiah being a savior for all mankind, Gentiles as well as Jews. They didn't envision any of that. But Jesus asked them the question, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they answered correctly, the son of David. You know, actually, that was a very easy question in that day. Everyone knew the answer to that. Uh, it would be like asking what the movie Snakes on a Plane is about. <laughs> it's about snakes on a plane right? Whose son is the Christ? The son of David. Duh. We know that. Everyone knows that. As Mark picks up the conversation, Jesus asks a, a, another question, a warm-up question in verse 35. How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? And once again, easy question. And it's meant to get them thinking uh, about the Old Testament scriptures. And the Old Testament has all sorts of places that taught that the Messiah would be a physical descendant of David. 
Uh, we're not going to look at them all. We'd be here all day. But for example, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, speaking to David, it says, The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Uh, through Nathan the prophet, God promised David that from his offspring, God would raise up a king who would reign on his throne forever in justice, in righteousness. Psalm 89 tells us, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His descendants shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, and the witness in the sky is faithful. I mean, this, this hope for a messianic king from David's line is throughout the Old Testament. It's developed in the prophets where, where the Messiah is referred to as a shoot from the stump of Jesse, uh, as a righteous branch, a, a new David. And even though the, the, the phrase son of David is not a messianic title that we find in the Old Testament, it became a favorite title for the Messiah in, in rabbinic Judaism. Uh, once again, Bartimaeus, what, he, what did he cry out? Son of David, have mercy on me. Uh, the, the, the crowd at the Palm Sunday, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. It, it, it illustrates that this title is being used about the Messiah in Jesus' time. In Matthew 9, it records that two men followed him crying out, have mercy on us, son of David. After Jesus healed a blind and a mute man, we read all the crowds were amazed and were saying this man cannot be the son of David, can he? Matthew 15, 22 notes that even a Canaanite woman came out and began to cry out saying, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Everyone knew the Messiah would be a son of David. And you know, if you went back and read the genealogies of Jesus that are given in scripture, it's irrefutable proof that he was a descendant of David. I mean, both his earthly father, Joseph, and his mother, Mary, were direct descendants of David. Jesus was as well. And, and that could be verified easily or found to be untrue in the genealog uh, gene genealogical, uh, there we go, records that were carefully kept, were undoubtedly checked out by, by the Sanhedrin. If Jesus had not been a descendant from David, his claim could have been proven false immediately. And that none of his opponents ever challenged his ancestry from David offers proof to its validity. So the Messiah, the Christ, had to be a descendant of David. The scribes knew this. Everyone knew this. They, they were looking for a, a national warrior deliverer, human, who was of David's bloodline. And so Jesus has warmed them up with this question and why they're reflecting on the relationship of the Messiah and, and the bloodline of David. They're, they're thinking of this. Jesus then takes them to Psalm 110, which the scribes recognized as a messianic prophecy. And, and Jesus emphasized the authority of this passage. Uh, look at it there in verse 36. Jesus says, David himself said in the Holy Spirit, or speaking in the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus is saying this is an inspired text that David wrote. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Listen to Psalm 110 and what David says, speaking by the Holy Spirit. He says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Obviously, to, to, to speak in the Holy Spirit is to speak as a prophet by, by divine inspiration. Uh, in 2 Samuel 23, David said, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. And David's identified as a prophet in Acts. He's said to have spoken by the Holy Spirit in Acts 1 and Acts 4. Uh, saying all this, Jesus, the New Testament authors, the apostles, the disciples, viewed the Holy Spirit's guidance in the production of Scripture as, as so intimate that Quotes of the Old Testament in the New Testament are sometimes introduced with phrases like this from Acts chapter 28. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers. I mean, obviously, 
the inspiration of Scripture is clear. It, it claims it for itself. We see it throughout Scripture. Jesus believed it, and so should we. So Jesus says, David's speaking by the Spirit, and then he quotes from Psalm 110. You know, Psalm 110 is the most qu quoted passage in all the New Testament. Uh, it's referred to some 30 plus times in the New Testament. Peter uses it, as does the writer of Hebrews. Paul alludes to it. It's found several times throughout the New Testament. And it's frequently used by the New Testament authors to, to affirm Jesus' vindication at God's right hand after his suffering, after his death, after his resurrection. Jesus alludes to this passage in combination with Daniel chapter 7 at his trial before the Sanhedrin. We'll look at that when we get to Mark 14. But the New Testament writers clearly understood how important Psalm 110 is for understanding the person and the work of Jesus. And so the scribes answer that the Messiah would be the son of David is correct, but it's not complete. Uh, they, they thought the Messiah would be a powerful, triumphant human ruler who would bring Israel's promised prominence. But Jesus, by bringing them to Psalm 110, verse 1, reveals how inadequate that belief was. There's much more to it than that. Psalm 110, verse 1, proves the Messiah would not be merely a man because David refers to him as his Lord. And, and, and Jesus' simple argument here that he never actually explains, he just lays it before them, is powerful, it is convincing. And it became widely known after the New Testament was written. You know, just a little bit of background. If, if you try to find writings from the Jews that Psalm 110 was a messianic prophecy, you're not going to find them because it pointed to Jesus. And they denied that it is a messianic psalm. It refers either to Abraham or Melchizedek or, or Judas Maccabeus or somebody else. They, they avoid it like that. But here in Psalm 110, verse 1, there's a conversation going on. And there's a conversation between two members of the Godhead. David writes, the Lord, and in your Bible, if you're in the Psalm uh, portion, Psalm 110, verse 1, the first Lord is small caps. The Lord says to my Lord, second Lord is not in small caps. When it's in small caps like that, it means Yahweh or Jehovah, right? It's indicated by those capital letters. The sacred name for God, the, the ineffable name, the, the, the name by which God revealed himself to Moses there in the wilderness of, of Midianite when he said, I am who I am. The second Lord, lowercase, is Adonai. It means master or sovereign one. It emphasized the authority and superiority of that person. It refers to an individual greater than the speaker, okay? So David is the speaker, and he says, Yahweh says to my Adonai. That's the way the psalm opens. Since David was the, the highest ruler in the kingdom, who must his Adonai be? God himself. The eternal son of God had to come to earth as a human born into the family of David. He had to be a son of David in that sense. As a descendant of God, Jesus is the root of and the descendant of David. We see that in Revelation. And so then Jesus asks this question. David himself calls him Lord. So in what sense is he his son? You know, this is not a, a, a mental sleight of hand on Jesus' part. He's not playing with semantics. No, this is an excellent question. If David calls him Lord, in what sense is he his son? How can the Messiah be both David's son and David's Lord if the Messiah is merely human? Well, given their understanding of the Messiah, given their admission that this is a messianic prophecy, they could not come up with an answer. Jesus is using the scriptures, which they are supposedly such experts in, to expand their, their limited idea of the Messiah. He says, it's going to take a divine human 
to fulfill the scriptural requirements for the Messiah. And that's the point the apostles made time and time again in their preaching. Jesus asked how this great King David can describe one of his descendants as greater than himself. And the point he's making is that the scribes have missed something very important about the Messiah. He's not just human. He's not just a man. David refers to the Messiah as his Lord or his master, affirming the Messiah's lordship, superior status over him. And so once again, Yahweh is having a conversation with with someone who's given the title Adonai. In most cases in the Old Testament where the word Adonai is used, it's the title for Yahweh. The one who is absolutely sovereign over everything. You know, from time to time, you you find these words used back to back in Scripture, Lord and Lord, capital Lord and lowercase Lord. For example, in Psalm 8, how does it begin? O Lord, our Lord, right? How majestic is your name in all the earth? Literally, it reads what? O Yahweh, our Adonai. It's saying Yahweh is the sovereign one. How excellent is your name? And so Yahweh and Adonai usually refer to God, to the same person, right? They still do. And here in Psalm 110, we find Yahweh calling someone beside himself Adonai. And David certainly is not saying the Lord said to himself. No, that's not, a, that's not happening. He, the Lord said to my Lord, to my Adonai. He's thinking of two different people. Who then is David's Adonai? Who is sovereign over the greatest king of Israel? God himself, right? And so Jesus asks these scholars, what do you think about this? What is the Holy Spirit saying here? If David calls his physical descendant the Messiah, if he calls him his Lord, and he did, it could only be because the one to come would somehow be greater than David was. And the only way that can happen is if the Messiah were more than a mere man. He would have to be divine. He would have to be God in human flesh. And and so, yes, the scribes are, are correct in viewing the Messiah as a descendant of David and thus a man, but they didn't grasp that the Messiah isn't just David's son. He's also David's Lord. He is one with the Father from all eternity. You know, this is a side note, but do you see the Trinity there? David said, by the Spirit, Jehovah Adonai, the Messiah, Jesus. And so Jesus questions them to get them to think about the implications of what David wrote. The Messiah is both David's son and David's Lord. He is both man and God. And he's told to what? Sit at my right hand. The place of honor, the place of highest honor. You know, we we know that's the place of honor because that's what James and John requested of Jesus, right? Who can sit at your right and left hand? To sit at the king's right hand is is more than just an honor. It was to share in his rule as well. It signifies participation in, in, in royal dignity and royal power. And so David was saying by the Holy Spirit that when the Messiah had finished his labor in this world, He would be exalted to heaven and be enthroned at the right hand of God. It's a a prophetic invitation for Jesus to reign. And it's fulfilled when Jesus conquers sin, conquers death, conquers Satan, and is exalted into heaven. Where he assumes the position of authority at God the Father's right hand. Do you realize that's where Jesus is today? I mean, after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven where he was seated at the right hand of the Father, far above all rule and authority. His ascension into heaven and the promised outpouring of the Holy Spirit was proof of what? That God had made this Jesus, whom they crucified, both Lord and Christ, both Lord and Messiah. And so Psalm 110 is even looking to our time where Jesus the Messiah is risen, is ascended, where he is Lord over all at the right hand of the Father. But not only is he at the right hand of the Father, it continues, until I put your enemies beneath your feet. 
You know, to be placed beneath someone's feet is usually not a good place to be, right? You know that. Uh, it has the uh, whole idea of subduing them, having absolute control over them. Uh, remember back in Joshua 10, uh, we read these words. When they brought these kings out to Joshua, Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with him, come near and do what? Put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came near and put their feet on their necks. Joshua then said to them, do not fear or be dismayed. Be strong and courageous for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies with whom you fight. Not only is the Messiah going to sit at God's right hand, he's also going to have all his enemies at his feet one day. And so the Old Testament reveals not only the Messiah's humanity, he's going to be the son of David, but also his deity as being David's Lord exalted at the right hand of the Father. And this is the incomprehensible but infinite truth that Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man. And he is Lord. He's David's Lord. You know, it's not up to us to determine whether Jesus is Lord or not, right? He is Lord. We can fight that lordship. If we do so, we'll ultimately be broken by that lordship. We will be made his footstool. Or we can submit to his lordship in humility and obedience and worship him for who he is. Because once again, who is Jesus? We have to think of him as he truly is exalted to a position of honor at God's right hand. You know, if you were to survey uh, most people in our, our society, most people's image of Jesus is that either of a baby in a manger or a man dead on a cross. Both those images are wrong, right? He is no longer in a manger. He is no longer on a cross. That's all past. He came once to die for sin. And after that, he ascended to heaven to share in the fullness of God's power and God's glory. Uh, remember Stephen, the first Christian martyr? He, he has his dying vision of the exalted Christ. It's of Jesus doing what? Standing at the right hand of God, ready to receive him into heaven. When John has his vision of Jesus in the book of Revelation, he's so overcome by Jesus' heavenly splendor that he falls at his feet as though dead. Is that who we see Jesus as? You know, we do well to, to recover this understanding of who Jesus is and where he is now. And as we do, we're going to worship him better and with greater reverence as we should. Look at the question in verse 37 once again. David himself calls him Lord, so in what sense is he his son? I mean, Jesus starts with the recognized assumption that the Messiah would be the son, the descendant of David. But the title son suggests a measure of subordination or inferior, inferiority. I can't say that. You know what I mean. What's the son of a king? He's a prince, right? And he stays a prince until when? Until his father dies. Then he assumes the status of Lord. Uh, you know the saying, the king is dead, long live the king, right? It emphasizes not only the permanence of the reign, but, but the immediate transformation of the prince to king over the whole realm. But the shocking thing about Psalm 110 and Jesus' use of it is that David refers to his son as his Lord. And that's upside down, unless the son somehow has greater status than the father. How can David describe one of his descendants as greater as himself? I mean, in Jewish thought, that, that, that would never be done. The son is always in submission to the father. The son was never greater than the father. And by that kind of reasoning, as marvelous as the Messiah would be, if he was to be David's son, he could not be greater than David himself. Yet David calls his son, my Lord, indicating that Jesus isn't simply the son of David. He is David's sovereign. He is David's Adonai. He is David's Lord and King, the one that David must bow before. And so the Messiah is more than simply a new David or an heir to David's throne. He's much more than that. 
But that's what the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, most Jews' expectations for the Messiah was. No, Jesus, yes, son of David, but also what? Son of God. Matthew's passage, Jesus raises the question, whose son is he? He is the son of David, yes, but he's also the son of God. And son of God has, has been an important title throughout the book of Mark. It begins in Mark 1.1. 1, 1. It's highlighted through, through the father's statements, audible statements of Jesus being his beloved son. Uh, the demons recognize who Jesus is. The, the high priest at Jesus' trial uh, does the same. The centurion's acclamation at the foot of the cross, same thing. And so Jesus asks these questions. And we read in the latter part of verse 37, the result of all this, the large crowd enjoyed listening to him. They enjoyed listening to him. Uh, to hear gladly is an idiom meaning to, to delight in what you're hearing, to enjoy listening. And, and the amazement of the crowds that Jesus teaching has been common throughout Mark's gospel. It's mentioned time and time again. But since Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, the emphasis has been on the fear of the religious leaders because of Jesus' popularity. But this popularity and this large crowd enjoying listening to him is so soon going to be stirred by the leadership of Israel to choose Barabbas over Jesus. You know, it's interesting, the same phrase, uh, hearing him gladly, was, was used of Herod's delight in uh, conversing with John the Baptist. He delighted in that. He enjoyed that. How did that end up for John the Baptist? Yeah, he was executed. The crowd enjoyed listening to Jesus here, but it's not going to stop them from yelling, crucify him in a few days. And, and, and so as we, we read the conclusion to this passage, it's anticlimactic, it's tragic. I mean, from the majestic heights of, of Jesus' wisdom and masterful use of Psalm 110, proving his deity, we're immediately plunged into the depths of the rejection by the nation's leaders, as well as by the amused apathy of, of the crowd who, it says, enjoyed listening to him. And yet, they will call for his crucifixion. You know, it's not recorded that anyone fell on their faces here in the presence of the incarnate almighty God to repent and confess him as Lord and Savior. No. Here again, we see Jesus' wisdom, his knowledge. In this passage, it's, it's confirmation. Jesus, yes, he is the son of David. He is the messianic king from David's line. He will fulfill all the Old Testament scriptures linked to that. But he's much more than the son of David. He's also the son of God. He is Lord of all. And in a sense, this was a, a, a veiled self-proclamation that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the divine human man who fulfills this prophecy. And before this last week is over, Jesus, the son of David, the son of God, is going to die in fulfillment of prophecy. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, elsewhere. But then, what? His resurrection makes everything clear concerning his humanity and divinity. What did Paul say in the opening verses of, of Romans? He said, concerning his son who was born, what? Of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, our Lord. And then, as we know, came his ascension to the Father, fulfillment of Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So what does all this mean for us today? What, what is the lordship of Jesus? What does the divine sonship of Jesus mean for us today? I mean, to declare Jesus as Lord in Mark's day would be viewed as rebellion, sedition, because Caesar alone was Lord. 
Just as many Jews throughout history died with the Shema on their lips, many Christians died with the phrase, Jesus is Lord, on their lips. That was their cry. That was their hope of vindication. In Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, Jesus' exaltation to the right hand of the Father as both Lord and Messiah is confirmation of the vindication of his death. It's the assurance that we too will be raised from the dead. You know, few Christians in America are likely to suffer martyrdom for confessing Jesus as Lord. But that's not the case for believers throughout history or around the world even today. In some places, to confess Jesus as Lord is to invite persecution, even invite death. And yet, as believers in the persecuted church in Rome of Mark's day, as they would remind us, as Jesus has taught us, that perseverance that comes from this confession that Jesus is Lord results in eternal life. Those who wish to save their lives will what? Lose them. Whoever gives up their life for Jesus, for the gospel, will save it. And so Jesus, the Messiah, doesn't employ the, the, the political or military authority of David, at least not yet. But he's greater, far greater than the greatest king of Israel. The kingdom he brings is greater than that of our father David. It's the kingdom of the father. Since Jesus is king, what? We should submit to him. In Isaiah 45, God says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. God has sworn that's going to happen. So we either turn to him willingly now and are saved, or we are crushed in submission when Jesus returns. John MacArthur says another way of, of demonstrating Christ's deity is to ask this question. If God became a man, what would we expect him to be like? He gives five answers. If, if God became a man, we'd expect him to be sinless because God is absolutely holy. Jesus is sinless, right? Even his enemies could make no reply to the challenge, which one of you convicts me of sin? Secondly, if God became a man, we'd expect his words to be the greatest words ever spoken. God is omniscient. He is perfectly wise. He has infinite command of the truth, the ability to perfectly express it. Jesus' words demonstrated all of that. I mean, the officers sent to arrest him reported back, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. Third, if God became a man, we'd expect him to display supernatural power. Because God is all-powerful. Well, Jesus controlled nature. He walked on water. He healed the sick, raised the dead, dominated the kingdom of Satan and the demons. He, he supernaturally avoided those who tried to kill him. He performed miracles too numerous to count. We could go on and on. Fourth, if God became a man, we'd expect him to exert a profound influence over humanity. Has there been anyone in the world who has changed the world like Jesus has? No. And then finally, if God became a man, we'd expect him to manifest God's love, grace, mercy, kindness, compassion, justice, judgment, wrath, on and on. And Jesus did. He was in every way the exact representation of God because he is God in, in flesh. So once again, the biggest question of all of life is this. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? That's the question that Jesus used to get this discussion going. And if you answer only that he is the son of David, you're making a mistake that will separate you from him now and forever. If you answer that he is the son of David and the Lord in human flesh, you're on the right track. And if you believe this, resting your soul upon it, he will save you. He will forgive your sins. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, his conclusion is as, was as, is as valid today as it was then. He said this, Therefore, Having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, 
Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. When the people on the day of Pentecost were convicted by this preaching, you remember what they cried out? What shall we do? Peter answered, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Consider Jesus' question to the Pharisees, to the scribes. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? He's David's son, yes, but even more, he's David's Lord. Is he your Lord today? Father, we come before you thanking you for your word, thanking you for the clarity of who Jesus Christ truly is. Father, it's our prayer that our understanding would be biblical, would be according to what you have revealed to us. Father, we pray that if there are any here who have not received by faith the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, that today might be the day that your spirit draws them to yourself, that they come to the correct conclusion of who Jesus truly is and what he has done in taking our place for the punishment of our sins there upon the cross. A sacrifice being sufficient, being raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, seated at the right hand of God. Father, one day everyone will be in submission to him. We pray that we would do so by choice even today. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.